Answers in Genesis and Cedarville College present. Answers with Ken Ham. A 12-part video series defending the Bible from the very first verse. Today's question, did God create in six literal days? And now, Ken Ham. You know, the very first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. If I was to teach that verse in church after church after church across America or Bible college, seminaries, I'm sure most people would agree with me. Of course, God created. But you know what? If I was to insist that God created in six literal days, do you think most people even in our churches would agree with me? You know what the answer is? No, they wouldn't. I found the majority of Christian leaders, the majority of theologians, the majority of uh, Christian college professors will not insist that God made everything in six literal days. Many of them say millions of years or, or billions of years or something like that. And so what I want to do in this particular session is to talk about those days of creation because I'm going to make a very bold statement here. If we don't believe in six literal days, we actually open the door to the collapse of Christian morality in our nation. Now, that, how can I get from six days to, to Christian morality? Well, let's have a look at this. You know what's fascinating to me? When you look in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the word day is used in the singular or plural form over 2,000 times. You know what is fascinating? Do you know, do you know what is just so mind-boggling? The only time I find people basically questioning what the word day means is in Genesis 1. Do you ever hear, hear, hear people questioning what the word day means in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua? I mean, you know, when Joshua marched around Jericho, do you hear people saying, I wonder if it was a day or if it was a million years, you know, marching around Jericho? I mean, you don't hear that, do you? The only place you hear people really questioning what the word day means is in Genesis chapter 1. Now, why is that? Because, see, if you just take the Bible alone without any outside influences at all, just the Bible on its own, would you ever get the idea of millions of years or billions of years? The answer is no. You never get that from just the Bible alone. When you take the Bible on its own, you only get the idea of, of thousands of years. Of course, many people say, but wait a minute, what about all these dating methods? Iridium, uh, uh, rubidium, strontium, and uranium lead, and potassium argon, and all sorts of dating methods. I'm not going to talk about those in this particular session, because all those dating methods are based on assumptions. We have lots of research material in our books and magazine that you can obtain to find out more about that. But let me just say this. Every single age dating method is based upon a change with time, you know, radiometric dating methods or influx of salt in the oceans or erosion of the land or whatever it happens to be. Every one of those methods is based on assumptions in relation to the past that can't be proved. And in fact, you often get whole ranges of dates from zero years to millions to hundreds of millions to billions. In fact, you could come up with a dating method for any age of the earth that you really wanted. And the other interesting thing is that 90% of all those age dating methods, 90% of them give dates far younger than evolutionists require. So you see, there's something wrong with those. But I want to challenge us on this basis. If we start with just the Bible alone, and it's obvious that God made everything in six days just thousands of years ago. Are we prepared to believe that and then recognize there must be something wrong with man's theories? So let's have a look at this in, in a little bit more detail. What happened in the past was this. Scientists handed the idea of millions and billions of years to theologians who said, hmm, what are we going to do with these millions and billions of years? Somehow we've got to fit them in with the Bible. And so they tried to work out how you could fit millions and billions of years into the Bible. Now, Think about this. You know those passages of the Bible you like to read before you go to sleep? You know, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. <laughs> sort of seem like boring passages, don't they? But do you know why they're very important? Because so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, Joseph, Mary, then we have Jesus. You know why those genealogies are there? To show that Jesus is a descendant of the first Adam to show that we all go back to the first Adam. You see, you can't put millions of years in those genealogies. If you tried to do that, it would destroy them. And so, therefore, scientists have recognized the only, uh, or theologians have recognized, the only place you can try to fit millions of years into the Bible is somewhere before Adam. And that's what's happened. And in history, for instance, back in the 1800s, a great man of God who loved the Lord, who's in heaven now, Thomas Chalmers, the founder of the Free Church of Scotland, came up with this idea of putting millions of years in between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 and invented the gap theory. How many of you have heard of the gap theory, the idea of a previous creation and then uh, it, it was ruled by Lucifer and then a judgment came and, and that's where you fit the millions of years and dinosaurs and then God created everything in six days. Well, 
a number of problems with that. By the way, in Colossians it says all principalities, all powers were made by and for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ made, made everything, right? Everything. The universe, all principalities, all powers includes the angels. Therefore, to me, I believe the angels must be a part of this creation. And if at the end of the sixth day God said everything he made was very good, doesn't that include the angels? So how can you have rebellion before that time? That doesn't make any sense, does it? And then if you've got millions of years of, of dinosaurs and so on uh, in this time, then you've got death before sin, and we've already discussed in other sessions that death, bloodshed, disease and suffering is a consequence of sin. Of course, some people even say, well, what about the word replenish? You know, in the King James Bible, Adam and Eve were told to replenish the earth. Well, actually, the Hebrew word means fill or fill up. It does not mean refill. Some people think it means refill, and therefore there are already people on the earth before that time. But uh, the word replenish has changed meaning over time. Back when the King James Bible was translated, it just meant uh, to, to, to fill. Uh, today we might use the word replenish to mean refill, but actually the Hebrew word means fill or fill up. And it's important to understand that. Actually, as you look at it, what you find is this. People tried to fit the millions of years in between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, the gap theory, or they said the days of creation were long periods of time, or they said that maybe the universe was here for, for billions of years. But all of these positions have one thing in common. Do you know what the one thing is in common? They're starting from outside the Bible with man's theories about the age of the universe and trying to add that to the Bible. And that there is a real problem. Because then we're saying that man's theories can be a judge on God's word. You see, when we take the word day, you know, think about this for a moment. How, you know why we can communicate here in this auditorium? Because words in context have meaning, don't they? I mean, if you were to read a, a recipe and it says, put in six cups of flour, do you say, I wonder what six means? I wonder what cups mean? I wonder what flour means? I know, three cups of gypsum, that's what it means. Or three buckets of gypsum. Not at all. Six means six. Flour means flour, I mean, cups mean cup, isn't that right? Because you know it's a recipe. You know, Genesis is written as historical narrative. I, I all the time have people saying to me, ah, oh, you know, you take Genesis the way you do because that's your interpretation of Genesis. Well, you know, in, in a sense, I, I'm not interpreting it literally, I'm just reading it as it is. You know, people say that's your interpretation. You know, when I was over in, in Belgium and, and went to the area where, where they had the monument to the Battle of, of Waterloo and talked about Napoleon and so on, and you read the history and it says, Napoleon went over here and he took a certain number of soldiers here and put guns over here. I mean, did I say, what does Napoleon mean? What, does, what do guns mean? What, what does go over here mean? No, I read it and said, oh, that's what he did. <laughs> and you know, that's how I read Genesis. You know, people say, well, you interpret Genesis in a particular way. Well, it says, God took dust and made a man. Do you know what I think that means? God took dust and made a man. I mean, I think that's what it means, because that's what it says. But you see, the reason we communicate, God, because we have a language, God made language. God communicates to us in, in language. And what we need to do is to take the language that God has had people use to write the Bible and let it speak to us and not us impose our ideas on the language. Correct? That's the way we should start, shouldn't we? Let's take the word day in the English language. Look at this sentence. Back in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback during the day. Well, back in my father's day, what was the word day mean there? Time. Back in my father's time, it took 10 days. Well, that we'll be talking about uh, ordinary days. And then during the day, well, uh, the daylight portion of a day. There's a word day having three different meanings. See, any word can have two or more meanings dependent upon context. It's context that determines meaning. Now, if we start with the Bible building our thinking on the Bible, and we go to the Old Testament and look at the way the word day is used. Here's what's interesting. The Hebrew word yom, the word day, we're going to look at its usage outside of Genesis 1. We're going to exclude the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1. Outside of Genesis 1, whenever day is used with a number over 400 times, it always means an ordinary day. There's only a couple of those you could try to argue about because they're in a prophetic sense, but they still mean an ordinary day. Whenever the phrase evening and morning is used, outside of Genesis 1, without the word day, 38 times, it always means an ordinary day. Whenever the words evening or morning are used by themselves with the word day, outside of Genesis 1, 23 times each, always mean an ordinary day. And whenever the word night is used with the word day, outside of Genesis 1, 52 times, uh, it, it means an ordinary day every single time. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Let's have a look at Genesis chapter 1. What do we read? Verse 5, night, evening, morning, number, day. And then verse 8, evening, morning, number, day. Verse 13, evening, morning, number, day. Verse 19, evening, morning, number, day. Let's go back and look at the first day here in, in verse 5. The word night, 
You know what the Hebrew writer is saying here? The author is saying, it's an ordinary day. And, and, and then we've got evening. In case you didn't get it right, it's an ordinary day. Then we've got morning. In case you're a little thick, it's really an ordinary day. And then what have we got here again? A number. In case you're really intellectually challenged, this is an ordinary day. <laughs> I mean, how else could you tell someone this is an ordinary day? It's so obvious. Now, I've got a little cartoon here that sums things up for me. Little boy and girl, six days, yep. Six truly, really days, yep. Sure, it says six days, yep. Wonder why it took so long. Do you think that God could make everything in six seconds? Who thinks he could make everything in six seconds? Okay. Who thinks he could make everything in one second? Okay, I agree with that. I think God could make everything in no time at all. Let me ask you a question. Why did he string it out over six days? <laughs> That's a long time for an infinite creator to take to make everything, isn't it? You know why he strung it out over six days? He actually tells us. Exodus 20, verse 11, which is the basis of the fourth commandment. You know what he says there? God says, in six days he made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything, and he rested on the seventh day, and that's the basis for our seven-day week. Six plus one equals what? Seven. If God made everything in six days and, and, and rested for one day, and those days were millions of years, think about that. Six million year week followed by a million year rest or something. That'd be an interesting week, wouldn't it? <laughs> All these uh, students here wouldn't have to do their homework, go along and say, didn't do my homework, miss, why not? I'm in the million year rest. <laughs> of course, if your church or school doesn't believe in six literal days, you could get away with that, right? <laughs> but if they do believe in six literal days and you have to do your homework on, on the days appointed, very, very important. You know, it, it's fascinating. I had a lady once come to me at a seminar and she said, I don't limit God like you creationists. I allow God billions of years. <laughs> I said, ma'am, I don't limit God, but I do limit myself to letting God tell me what he did. I don't tell God what he did. And you know what? That's the problem we've got today. We need to let God tell us what he did, not us tell God what he did. That's very, very important. You know, when, when you think about that passage in six days that God made everything, you know what the Bible tells us about that passage? See, we know that all scripture is inspired by God, but in six days God making everything is actually inscribed by God. The very finger of God wrote that on, on stones. Uh, for the Israelites. God himself inscribed that passage in six days. Isn't that fascinating? You know what I'm really telling you? When you start from the language, the language the Bible is written in, what does the word day mean? It means, in, in Genesis chapter 1, in context, the word day means an ordinary day. Now, in Genesis 2, there is a place where it says, in the day that the Lord created, and it doesn't mean just an ordinary day there. You know why? It's not qualified by evening. It's not qualified by number. It's not qualified by morning. It's not qualified by night. It's saying in the time that God created. Because, you see, the word day can have many different meanings depending upon context. If you look up a, a good Hebrew lexicon like Brown Driver Briggs or something like that, there, there are many headings for the word day, about seven headings and a number of subheadings. The main meaning for the word day, by the way, is ordinary day. You know, it was fascinating, too, at a seminar, I had a pastor come to me once and he said, but the word day can mean something other than ordinary day. I said, that's true, but it can also mean an ordinary day. He said, but it can mean something other than ordinary day. I said, that's right, but it can also mean an ordinary day. He said, but it can mean something other than ordinary day. I said, that's right, but it can mean, an, an, but it, its main meaning is an ordinary day. And I said, besides which, pastor, you're saying it can mean something other than ordinary day. That's true, but can the word day ever mean day? Does day mean day? When does day mean day? I mean, does day ever mean day? <laughs> I, I, I think he got the point. He was trying to say, because it can mean something other than ordinary day, does that mean it never means day? Of course not. But, you know, then we get all these objections. I'm sure you've heard of them. Who's heard of this objection? But the Bible says a day is like a thousand years. Put your hand up if you heard that. Uh -huh. I always tell people, read the rest of the verse. And a thousand years are like a day. That sort of cancels that one right out, doesn't it? <laughs> if one day equals a thousand years and you change it to a thousand years and, and then a thousand years equals a day and you change it all back again, it cancels it all out, doesn't it? You know, when I get on radio programs, uh, in fact, just before we, we uh, gave this series, I was on a number of radio programs and people brought up this passage. But a day's like a thousand years. And I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a passage in the New Testament. You can't use a passage in the New Testament to determine the meaning of a Hebrew word in Genesis. The Hebrew word for day depends upon the Hebrew language. You can't use some passage in the New Testament to say, therefore the word day means, means a thousand years. That, that doesn't make any sense. You've got to start with the Hebrew language. Besides which, that passage in 2 Peter 3 is saying that God is outside of time. But you know what? In Psalm 90, it says a day is like a thousand years. Then it says a thousand years are like a watch in the night, which is like three hours or four hours. We're going to say the days are four hours now and, and, and not ordinary days. And, you know, if you said each day was a thousand years, that doesn't help. 
because people who want to not believe in, in six days want to do so because of the millions of years. So why is, why is a thousand years going to help you? That doesn't, doesn't make any sense either. And besides which, something else. If a day is like a thousand years, why is it, why is it that the only place we try to apply that is Genesis chapter 1? I mean, why not apply it to the rest of the Bible? For instance, take Jonah. Was he in the whale 3,000 years? That doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> not at all. But you know, there are other objections. I often quote famous Christian leaders or Christian organizations in my talks, and I don't do so to undermine them or to undermine their ministry. In fact, many of them I have a great respect for and uh, use their materials. But we need to be aware of the way in which the church is thinking these days to, to do what the Bible says, to be Bereans and search the Scriptures, see if these things be so. And, and in Thessalonians, we're told to test all things. And if it doesn't fit with Scripture, then you, you must throw it out. It's very important for us to do that. We need to be trained to do that. You need to do that with what I'm telling you as well. One famous Christian leader doesn't believe in six days, and he says this, the sun was not created until the fourth day. So is the first day really a day? I don't know. You know, I have a real problem when I read quotes like that. You know why? The Bible does tell us that the sun was made on day four, but it's not a matter of the sun made on day four, which means you can't believe in ordinary days. We shouldn't be looking at that and saying, oh, we see a problem here. We should be saying, what does the language say? If the words teach us that they're ordinary days, if the words tell us that they're ordinary days, then they're ordinary days, then we should say, what about the sun on day four? You see what I'm saying? In other words, you don't start with a problem with the sun, you start with what does the language say? Because if we don't read the Bible like that, we could make it mean anything we want to make it to mean. What about the sun on day four? Some people say, but how can you have day and night without the sun? You don't need the sun for day and night, you need light. And the Bible says you've got light on day one. We're just not told exactly where it came from. But we've got evening and morning, we've got a rotating earth. What's the problem? There's no problem. You know really why this particular Christian leader doesn't believe in six days? Because he also says, I believe in the Big Bang. When you believe in the Big Bang, you believe in billions of years, you believe in billions of years, then you can't believe in ordinary days. And that's really the, the thing that I want to point out to you, is that what I found over and over again, theologians who don't believe in six days, it's not because of what the Bible clearly says, it's because they're influenced from outside ideas and that is a situation that we need to combat in the church because it means we're starting outside the Bible to reinterpret what the Bible says. Well, then you may as well do that through the rest of Scripture as well. You know, if we put on our evolutionized glasses, the idea of millions of years, that's what's happening. Much of the church has got on these evolutionized glasses and then we're taking that idea of millions of years to the Bible. Let me give you some examples here real quickly. Let's, let's quote some Christian, readers, uh, Christian writers and some professors at uh, Christian colleges and some theologians. This Christian writer said this, Christians are often inclined to take the young earth position simply because it appears to be the plainest reading of the Bible. Well, that's true. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> Here's a Christian college professor who says this, now, this particular college professor believes in the Big Bang, billions of years, local flood, believes the days of creation are long periods of time. But he says, it is apparent that the most straightforward understanding of the Genesis record, if you read it in a straightforward way, he says, without regard to all of the hermeneutical considerations suggested by science, is that God created heaven and earth in six solar days. Now, he believes in millions of years. He says, if you read Genesis in a straightforward way, it teaches six days. But he says, without regard to hermeneutical considerations suggested by science. Do you realize what he's saying? If you take the Bible on its own and read Genesis, it says six days. It can't be six days because he starts with the idea of millions of years. Therefore, he reinterprets the days. Here's another one. A, a Christian professor who doesn't believe in six literal days. And here's one of his reasons why not. He says a superficial reading of Genesis 1, the impression would seem to be six 24-hour days. Why doesn't he believe that? He says, this seems to run counter to modern scientific research, which indicates that planet Earth was created several billion years ago. Do you see the pattern here? Yeah, if you read the Bible in a straightforward way, it's six, six, six days, but it can't be six days. Why? Because of millions of years. There was a famous theologian, Charles Hodge, who was once at uh, Princeton uh, College. And of course, Charles Hodge was a, a great Christian man. He's in heaven today. Uh, and Charles Hodge, sadly, though, didn't take a stand on six literal days. By the way, Harvard, Yale, Princeton... How many of those Ivy League schools were once Christian? Probably all of them. How many are Christian today? None of them. And you wonder why. I think it's because things like this contributed to their downfall. Charles Hodge said this. It is, of course, admitted that taking this account, the account of Genesis, by itself, it would be most natural to understand the word, the word day, in its ordinary sense. 
Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> I agree with that. But if that sense brings a mosaic account into conflict with facts and another sense avoids a conflict, it's obligatory to adopt the other. Can you imagine generations going through a college being told, yeah, if the Bible, the Bible says day, and that's what it means, but it can't be day because of outside influences, then you can reinterpret the Bible, then you've just opened a door to unlock the undermining of the authority of Scripture. That's what's really happened. Here's another famous uh, theologian, Bible teacher. He doesn't believe in six literal days, but he says, we have to admit here that the exegetical basis of the creationists is strong. Their arguments from Scripture are strong, but why doesn't believe in six days and take a stand on it? He says, data from various disciplines points to a very old earth and even older universe. Do you see the same thing again? Yeah, the arguments from Scripture that they're ordinary days, yeah, that's strong, but can't be. Why not? Millions of years. Here's another interesting quote from a, a magazine from a Christian organization in England that produces Sunday school material for the church. They said this, the study of paleontology has rendered it virtually impossible for a serious scientist to make a case for a six-day creation about 6,000 years ago as Christians would have once believed without question. <laughs> Why would Christians once believed it without question? Because that's what the Bible said. But they said the study of paleontology, what's that? The study of fossils. When do fossils exist? In the present, paleontology is an interpretation of what happened to form these fossils in the present. That, that they're not just brute facts or anything like that. What they're really saying is, yep, the Bible says six days, but we can't believe that because of the idea of millions of years. That's really the bottom line. That's really what it's all about. I've, I've got a challenge for you. I want you to think about this. If the Bible says six days in the language, if the language makes it clear it's six days, the words of Scripture in context, according to the type of language, it means six days, but it can't be six days because of outside influences. In effect, you've just said the Bible is fallible. And if the Bible is fallible in Genesis, why shouldn't it be fallible elsewhere throughout Scripture? And in fact, people who do not believe in six days have unlocked a door and they've taught the public this. We don't have to take the Bible as written from the very beginning. They just undermine the entire authority of Scripture. Think about this. Why do I believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ? Science has never shown me one. If I start from science, I wouldn't believe in the resurrection, would I? Why do I believe in the virgin birth? Science has never shown a virgin birth in humans. So if I start from science, I shouldn't believe in the virgin birth. You know why I believe in the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection? Because of the words of Scripture. Do you know why I believe in six days? Because of the words of Scripture. You know, when, when famous Christian leaders are teaching the public today, teaching the church, you don't have to believe in six days, I like to challenge them with a quote from Martin Luther, a man who started the Reformation. Martin Luther said this, We must understand that these days were actual days contrary to the opinion of the Holy Fathers. Whenever we observe that the opinions of the Fathers disagree with Scripture, we reverently bear with them, acknowledge them to be our elders, give honour where honour is due, in other words, and respect Nevertheless, we do not depart from the authority of Scripture for their sake. doesn't matter how great a Christian leader you are, if you depart from the authority of Scripture, then we need to challenge that, don't we? And see, there's another important factor here. We've discussed it in other sessions. As soon as you believe in millions of years, you've got death and bloodshed and disease and suffering and thorns before sin. Because when you've got millions of years of fossils, you've got diseases like cancer, bloodshed, all sorts of other diseases, violence, suffering thorns before sin, because that's what you find in the fossil record. But the Bible says when God made everything, it was very good. Sin, death, disease, bloodshed of, of animals, man came as a consequence of sin. So as soon as you believe in millions of years, you've undermined the entire gospel because you've got death and bloodshed before sin, whereas the Bible says God instituted death and bloodshed because of sin. That's why without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. You know, when you take God's perfect word and man's fallible opinion, when people try to make them agree, which one usually gets modified? You know the sad thing? It's usually the Bible, isn't it? And that's why I like this quote from Martin Luther. It's my favorite quote of Martin Luther. In his day, he had a problem. Some of the church fathers believed God made everything in one day. He had to convince them it was longer than that. <laughs> we have the opposite problem today, don't we? <laughs> Martin Luther said this, When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, and let this period continue to have been six days, and do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day then this next statement of his is my favorite. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. <laughs> Don't you like that? <laughs> I really like that. It's my favorite statement. And then the next statement of Martin Luther sums up for me the problem that we've always had 
in the church. It's a problem that goes back to the Garden of Eden. It's a problem that's always been with us. There's nothing new under the sun. Look what he says. For you are to deal with Scripture in such a way that you bear in mind that God himself says what is written, but since God is speaking, it is not fitting for you wantingly to turn his word in the direction you wish to go. Do you know what Adam tried to do back in the Garden of Eden? Well, what he did, in, in effect, I'm not going to listen to God's word. I'm going to decide truth for myself. Do you know who we are? Sons and daughters of Adam. Do you know what our problem is? We would rather listen to the words of men than the word of God. And friends, you know what our big problem today is? We need to stand upon the authority of the word of God. And if the word of God makes it clear that God made everything in six days, and you can add up all those genealogies in the Bible, and it comes to thousands of years, then you know there's something wrong with the millions of years, even if you don't understand the dating methods. And we can give you lots of material on that to help you go through that. But are we prepared to stand on God's word? Because if you do, I'm going to warn you, you're going to be scoffed at in today's world because the majority of people do not believe in six days. And even in our church, I find that that's so. One last thing. The block diagrams that I often use in my, my talks again illustrate that when you start from God's word, we have a basis for right or wrong, a basis for marriage, a basis for purpose and meaning in life. But the more people believe that man determines truth, and that's what evolution's all about, that man determines truth, then why not write your own rules? Do what you want with sex, bought babies, etc. And see, the sad thing is this. When you reject the clear word of God in Genesis and say we can start outside the Bible to reinterpret God's word here, then you could do that elsewhere in Scripture, and ultimately, therefore, you will do that with doctrine, which is why I believe we find even people in our church today questioning what marriage means and questioning uh, whether or not abortion is okay and so on, because we've unlocked that door in Genesis. You don't have to take God's Word as written, and then that flows through the rest of the Bible and on to the doctrines that come out of that. And that's why I believe there's a connection between not believing in six days and the collapse of morality in a nation because ultimately it's undermining the authority of Scripture. And that's the bottom line. That's the, that's the real issue. I really would like to recommend to you uh, one particular book called The Answers Book, uh, where we go through and answer some of the most asked questions, and we have the issue of the days of creation in more detail. And I really encourage every one of us to subscribe to Creation Magazine, a great tool from our ministry that teaches you uh, every quarter tremendous material to enable you to defend your faith in today's world. Thank you. For more information on Answers in Genesis, call toll-free 1-800-350-3232 or visit our website at www.answersingenesis.org. This video series was produced on the campus of Cedarville College, a creationist Baptist college of arts, sciences, and professional programs. For more information, call toll-free 1-800-CEDARVILLE or visit the college website at www.cedarville.edu.